briefly summarize. It's a, a plane wave DFT code for material science slash chemistry simulations in the condensed phase. And uh, it's one of the most used uh, software packages at NERSC. And if you look at the sort of calculations that most users run, they're generally using uh, DFT calculations with local or semi-local functionals. Um, but really what people would like to do is go a step beyond that and use more sophisticated hybrid functionals which involve the calculation of uh, a large number of integrals that look like this. And um, you know, as uh, Robert said in the last talk, you know, there are many ways to think about performing this calculation and there are clever ways to get around just sort of the brute force evaluation of these integrals. Um, but that having been said, there are also certain systems where clever methods don't necessarily work as well and you may have to fall back on the brute force approach. Um, and also just if you look at what most users do if they are happening to use exact exchange, um, generally they are more or less just evaluating these integrals. Um, whether that's in their best interest or not might be another story, but uh, certainly there's a great deal of interest in improving the performance of the calculation of this particular quantity. A and what's really hard about this is the fact that you've got not only an integral here uh, that's, that's not trivial to evaluate, but also the fact that it's a doubly indexed integral. It's, it's indexed over both i and j, where those are two bands in the system. And so the, the, you're doing n squared integrals with respect to system size. And this gets very expensive very quickly. So if we look at the actual uh, relevant code, then it, it looks more or less like this. So as you might expect, there's a double loop over bands i and j, and then in the internal loop, you have um, what basically looks like an alternating set of dot products and FFTs, dot products and FFTs, and dot products. Um, <clears throat> and one of the things that we're most interested about on KNL is the the threaded performance of the code. So, so what I'm going to be talking about for the next few slides is specifically uh, running on a single KNL node. And in this particular case, uh, running in pure OMP mode with just one uh, MPI task and then uh, a variable number of threads. And what you can see is that, for, for example, this particular calculation on uh, 64 water molecules, the thread scaling is not particularly good. And there are a number of reasons for this. We've made quite a few improvements to the, uh, the threading of the code. But one of the big things is the fact that if you just look at the threading of these individual dot products, it basically looks like this. So basically what you have is within this inner J loop, you have uh, different threaded regions for each dot product. And the problem with this is that the evaluation of these dot products takes, uh, for this system, something like 0.3 milliseconds, which is small enough that just the cost of OMP overhead, a fork and join, ends up being more expensive than the actual uh, process of, of computation. And so one thing that we did to improve this was to say, well, we can reorder the loops in such a way as to increase the amount of work that's being done in each OMP region. And so what we basically did was, instead of having a single uh, loop over J outside of, of all of these uh, dot products, we have, for each individual dot product, uh, a loop over J. So within each threaded region, you're doing uh, in-band times uh, as, many, uh, as, as many operations as you were previously. And that means that overhead becomes a, a fairly negligible cost and your, threaded, your thread scaling improves significantly. Um, another thing that we're interested in is the performance on KNL with respect to different NUMA modes. And so if you, uh, this is the cost of performing that calculation on 64 water molecules if you just run the entire problem using cache. And then on the other hand, here's what happens if you run the same calculation in flat mode and just running completely out of VDR. Now, I, I should point out that this particular problem is large enough that you can't just uh, fit it entirely into MCD RAM. If you're running in flat mode, you can't just use like NUMA CTL-M1 or, or anything like that. Um, but what we can do is we can um, <coughs> explicitly place certain key arrays into MCD RAM through the use of fast mem directives. 
And uh, what we specifically did was we placed all of those arrays that uh, were part of the vector dot products on the last slide explicitly into MCD RAM. And when we do that, we find out that not only do we get much improved performance when running in flat mode, but also we, we actually outperform cache mode by something like 15%. Um, and this is, we, we think, simply related to the fact that um, you know, when you're using MCD RAM as cache, it's really not quite the same as having an L3 cache. And there are certain disadvantages to that that you can overcome. E even if you're not running entirely out of MCD RAM, um, if you just put the key arrays there, then, then you can actually sometimes outperform cache mode. Um, now, here, what I'm looking at is the relative performance of MPI mode versus OpenMP mode when running on KNL versus Haswell. So Haswell is in blue, KNL is in red. We've got, first of all, pure MPI mode um, with the, the original untouched code, and then MPI mode when using our, our modifications. And then you can see that uh, originally, using the old code, OMP was just much, much slower than pure MPI mode. Although now with our modifications, not only is it much faster both on Haswell and on KNL, but actually on, on a single KNL node, you're uh, getting considerably better performance than you would if you just ran in pure MPI mode. Um, now we'll be testing to see whether this sort of result holds as we go to larger numbers of KNL nodes, but, but at least on a single node, we can claim a, a certain amount of victory for a, a, a OMP approach to parallelization. Um, now, I'm going to sort of switch gears a little bit, and for the rest of the talk, I'm going to focus, instead of performance on a single KNL node, I'm going to focus on uh, the scalability of the code to large numbers of nodes. And since I didn't have access to uh, a, a large KNL cluster, uh, all of these calculations are performed on, uh, on NERSC's Edison system. And in, in order to discuss this notion, uh, I, I want to go into a little bit more detail about how Quantum Espresso is currently designed to parallelize uh, its calculations. And so there are actually a number of different types of parallelization supported by Quantum Espresso. Uh, and uh, th there are really only two, though, that are particularly important for this discussion. Uh, one of them is plane wave parallelization, and the other is band parallelization. So the idea behind plane wave parallelization is that you say, uh, okay, I'm going to take um, all of my, my plane waves and I'm going to distribute those over the entire set of cores that I'm computing on. And there, all the cores are going to contribute to the calculation of an individual FFT. So every time I'm doing an FFT, uh, all the cores are simultaneously contributing to that one FFT. On the other hand, you could do something more along the lines of band parallelization. And the idea here is that you're going to say, I'll divide up my cores into different band groups. And each different band group is going to work on different FFTs at the same time. And then within the band group, you can then use par uh, plane wave parallelization so that within the band group, you're parallelizing a single FFT, but between band groups, it's different FFTs. Um, and, and there's actually um, a couple of different ways in which this concept is implemented in Quantum Espresso. There's task group parallelization, which exists only um, outside of the exact exchange parts of the code. So that is to say, in parts of the code that where you're not calculating these uh, exact exchange integrals. And then there's band group parallelization, which is exactly the opposite. It's only implemented in regions of the code where you're uh, calculating the exact exchange integrals. And the choice of parallelization scheme matters a great deal in getting good performance um, across large numbers of nodes. So what I'm showing you here is a, a calculation on 64 water molecules with a, a constant number of 64 nodes, but then I'm just changing the number of task groups or band groups that I use. So on the left, I've got a calculation using just a, a semi-local DFT functional. On the right is a calculation with a hybrid DFT functional. And what you can see is that uh, when you're using the, the semi-local functional, 
task groups matter a, a fair bit. You get something like a factor of 2x speed up, depending on whether you use task groups versus not using them. Um, but when you're talking about hybrid DFT, then band parallelization really matters a great deal. I mean, this is a log scale, so we're talking a couple orders of magnitude here, improvement from when you don't use band groups at all to when you use the optimal number of band groups. And, and this really isn't all that surprising. I mean, FFTs are just known to be notoriously difficult to parallelize across large numbers of nodes. Um, but but it, it is just worthwhile to note that if you really want good scaling, uh, this is an essential part of the code. Now, that having been said, even if you use band parallelization, you still don't get very good strong scaling in Quantum Espresso. So this is just the strong scaling of performing a calculation on the 64 water system. And, and you know, you basically flatline at something like four or maybe eight uh, nodes. Um, you know, people would be willing to perform hybrid DFT calculations a lot more if they could just get decent time to solution. There's a lot of people who are willing to pay the cost just in terms of CPU hours. But if you can't scale up to a large number of nodes, then, then you're just out of business. And so what we want to look at is improving this. Um, and, and in order to, to show you what we've done, I'd like to take another look at the overall uh, picture of the code. And so here what I'm representing is just, just the entire uh, DFT calculation. Each of, these loops each of these ovals represents a different loop in the calculation. The leftmost loop here is the outer SCF loop. So this basically corresponds to everything outside of the calculation of exact exchange. This is all the stuff that you would normally calculate in a, a local DFT calculation. Um, this iterates your wave function and uh, so on and so forth. <coughs> Uh, and then within that, you've got a number of uh, additional loops. Here's the, the loop over I and J within the exact exchange calculation. So these, these loops are where you're actually calculating those exact exchange integrals. And I've color coded this so that what I show is in blue uh, are the ovals, uh, are, are loops that are parallelized with respect to band groups. And in red are all of the loops that are performed serially with respect to band groups. That is to say, all the work of the, in the red loops is just duplicated across every single band group in your system. Uh, and, and you know, you can see you're performing really a very large amount of the calculation in serial with respect to band groups. And as such, one of the things that you can immediately do in order to try and improve the, the performance of the code is to try to expand uh, the, the regions of the code that are actually parallelized. And so one of the things that we did was we implemented a band pair approach to parallelization. So whereas before within Quantum Espresso, you basically just had this inner loop and that was then parallelized across band groups and then everything else in the exact exchange calculation was just done serially. Uh, now what we're doing is we're instead parallelizing the calculation uh, over band pairs. So the idea is that both loop I and J are parallelized. And uh, we, we preferentially parallelize over the outer loop in order to minimize the amount of, of duplicated work that we're doing. And when we do this, we see uh, some nicely improved results. So here I'm showing a smaller calculation. This is just 16 water molecules. And I'm only showing the cost of evaluating the exact exchange integrals here. But you can see that the strong scaling of the um, improved code is quite a bit better than that of uh, the, the old code in this region. Um, also, you can notice a, a rather interesting property of the old code, which is that you get these uh, big jumps. And that's associated with the fact that we've got a, a system of 16 water molecules here with a total of 64 bands. If you're using band group parallelization with one band group per node, then uh, in this regime, you're, you're basically in the regime where the number of band groups is similar to the number of bands. And because you can only distribute an integer number of bands in the old scheme, that means that you're running into load balancing issues. And actually, you can never parallelize beyond 64 bands here. Um, so if I were to extend this plot, not that I can, but, but if, if, I were to, if I were able to perform calculations with larger numbers of nodes here, it would just be a flat line using the old code. Whereas with our code, we don't run into that issue. We can parallelize in principle to n squared uh, nodes. 
<sighs> now, looking back at the code again, there's still this rather unfortunate issue that everything outside of exact exchange is still done in serial. And so in other words, let's say you've got 100 nodes with a one band group per node. That means that every single node is individually responsible for doing the entirety of the local part of the calculation. So every single node is independently calculating the local parts of the potential. It's individually doing a diagonalization, updating psi, and so on and so forth. Um, and, and not only does that lead to large amounts of duplication of work, but it also kind of leads to other um, uh, somewhat unfortunate side effects, like the fact that if you've got 100 different nodes each calculating an updated version of psi, you're going to get uh, numerical effects that cause those values to diverge. And that means that you have to sync up the, these calculated values. Um, and that's done basically right as you start the exact exchange calculation, you just broadcast from one particular band group. You broadcast everything that it calculated to everybody else. So actually, those, all those other nodes might as well have just been doing nothing, just waiting. Um, and now that having been said, you might sort of wonder, well, hybrid DFT and, and the calculation of exact exchange is just so much more expensive than everything else. Maybe we can sort of get away with this. Uh, unfortunately, when you start talking about going to large numbers of nodes, that's just not the case anymore. Um, when you're basically performing that part of the calculation in serial, but you're parallelizing everything else, then it doesn't take long before the local parts of the calculation are the dominant cost. So actually, if we look at here, this is just using um, the, the old version of Quantum Espresso before we made any improvements. Uh, and you know, what you see is that as you go to larger numbers of nodes, the fraction of time you're spending in the local part of the calculation, that is to say the part of the calculation that's basically supposed to be free, increases. And, and you know, by the time you're at eight nodes, you're already spending about a, roughly a majority of your time doing stuff that's supposed to be cheap. Um, and, and of course, now that we've improved parts of the exact exchange, you know, this would just look worse. Um, <clears throat> now, there's a, an obvious way that you might be able to improve that, and that's just to say, well, look, Quantum Espresso has parallelization methods for the local parts of the code. You know, it's got plane wave parallelization, task group parallelization applies to the local regions of the code. So why not just set up the code so that when you're doing the local parts of the calculation, that is to say everything except the evaluation of the exact exchange integrals, then why not just perform the parallelization in the exact same way that you would have if you weren't using hybrid DFT and if you weren't using band groups. You know, that's sort of the obvious approach that one might desire to, to use. Uh, and then when you go to the exact exchange parts of the calculation, then you're going to, to use your band groups. But otherwise, you just run the calculation as though it were a regular local or semi-local calculation. That's what you might think. The problem with doing that, of course, is that it means that you end up having totally different data structures in the local and exact exchange regions of the code. If you want to independently parallelize the exact exchange and the local parts of the code, then you also have to have different data structures for things like psi and h psi. And uh, just to give you a, a rough idea of what that looks like, it, in the local parts of the code, what you want in order to get, in order to use the existing parallelization method, is you basically want to have uh, every node have a, a subset of the plane waves for all of the bands. Whereas when you go into the exact exchange parts of the code, you want instead for each node to have all of the plane waves, but only for a subset of the bands. Now you might look at this and think, well, that doesn't look too bad. It's basically just a transpose. Unfortunately, this is not nearly as simple as an all-to-all -all call or anything like that. Um, primarily because the ordering of the plane waves is different in each case. Uh, and what that means is this is not a, um, in terms of coding complexity, this is not a simple transformation to do. Um, and I, I won't, for lack of time, go into the details of how we do that. I'll just say that uh, we, we do a lot of work to map from one of these representations to the other, and then uh, we do a lot of 
calls to I send and I receive in order to make this happen uh, as you move from the local part to the exact part and back again. Um, but I will just show you that actually, d despite the, the sort of coding complexity and conceptual complexity of doing this, you can actually do this very efficiently. So here what I'm showing you is the, the total cost of inter-band group communication in the original implementation of Quantum Espresso. That's in red. Uh, and the primary cost here is that you've got, as I said, you've got a broadcast psi over all the different band groups, and then there's also a place where you've got to reduce some things. Uh, so that ends up being a pretty big cost, and it increases as you go to larger numbers of nodes. On the other hand, using our, our modified code, we don't have to do the broadcast. We don't really have to do much of a reduction. Basically, all the cost is just in transforming from one data structure representation to another. That's done through non-blocking sends and receives, and we, we can communicate a net, uh, the, the total amount of data that we're communicating is actually much less, uh, and, and in principle decreases as you go to larger numbers of nodes. So this is actually very fast, and uh, is a very small fraction of the cost of the calculation. So we actually save time by doing this, this data structure transformation relative to what we would otherwise be getting. And then finally, if you just look at the total, uh, the, the strong scaling of the code after making all of these improvements, what we see is that, you know, here, here you've got the, the poor strong scaling before, and here's the much improved strong scaling for a, a single SCF calculation in Quantum Espresso now. Uh, this is on 64 water molecules. Um, now, interestingly, um, the, if you just look at the strong scaling of the exact exchange part of the code, that's actually a fair bit better than the strong scaling of the, the calculation as a whole. So in other words, what that suggests is that if you want to further improve the scalability of uh, Quantum Espresso, then really you've got to focus on everything outside of exact exchange. So this sort of gets to the same point that Robert was making before, which is that once you've optimized exact exchange, you get into this regime where if you want to go any further, what you actually have to look at is the performance of everything else, the performance of basically a local calculation. And th that's sort of where we are here. Um, that having been said, we have achieved you know, something like a, an order of magnitude speed up when you're running at large scale. Um, so we're, we're very happy about that. Um, and overall, what we've seen is you know, when running on a single KNL node, you can use fast MIM directives to run very efficiently in flat mode. You can, uh, if you're careful about the OMP threading, you can get nice uh, MPI, OpenMP hybrid results. Uh, and when you're trying to run at scale, um, you really want to parallelize not just a single band, but you want to use this band pair parallelization technique that we've uh, been working on. A and also, you want to have some sort of independent parallelization of the local and the exact exchange parts of the code. And when you do that, you get very large improvements in not only the single node uh, performance, but uh, also just in the scalability of the code. And so I'd like to thank uh, all of the, the collaborators who have helped this to happen. Uh, and I'd also like to thank you for your attention. <laughs>